interested in that. Is that, first of all, do you know what the state of play on that is? And is that some, has the United States or is the United States planning to pursue that as a specific confidence building measure or one of the proposals where there might be mutual agreement? And is there anything else you can tell us in addition to what um, uh, Wendy Sherman said earlier about whether or not the Russians, um, what they indicated in terms of their openness to committing to anything beyond being at the OSCE meeting tomorrow? Uh, well, Missy, um, to your first question, we have always been very clear that we believe dialogue, we believe diplomacy, we believe engagement. Uh, is important. We believe it's especially important when times when tensions are high. This is certainly one of them. Uh, that's why we support the Secretary General's statement that NATO allies are interested in looking at the possibility of reestablishing respective NATO and Russian offices in Moscow and Brussels. Uh, regarding uh, future NATO-Russia Council sessions, uh, as proposed by the Secretary General, uh, it's also our hope that Russia will choose the path uh, of de-escalation uh, and diplomacy and engage in further dialogue uh, with NATO. Uh, but the, the point in all of this is that the NATO alliance came together uh, today. Uh, Russia had an opportunity to hear from uh, the Secretary General, from the 30 allies, um, and we hope uh, that Russia will uh, choose to remain engaged in this diplomatic process. It's not for us uh, to say what the Russians will choose or, uh, or will not choose. Uh, it is for us to say what our preference is, what we are prepared to do. We are very much uh, prepared to continue to uh, engage in diplomacy. That remains our very strong preference. Uh, it remains our strong preference because uh, we've been clear about the alternative. Uh, and the alternative that we have spoken to, that our uh, NATO allies and uh, partners have spoken to as well, is one of a strong uh, response with uh, unprecedented consequences for uh, the Russian economy and for the Russian Federation. Uh, we hope that remains a hypothetical. In order for it to remain a hypothetical, what we will need to see are a couple things. Uh, we will need to see continued engagement. And I think you heard uh, from uh, representatives of the Russian Federation today that they found uh, the meeting today uh, useful. I think they made similar comments after the strategic stability dialogue uh, on Monday. Uh, we hope that is a signal uh, that they will be willing to continue down this path. But the other point is that uh, dialogue and diplomacy are important, but we also need to see progress. And progress can only take place meaningfully uh, in the context of de-escalation. Uh, de-escalation is not something we have seen yet. Uh, and in fact, uh, you've, we've all seen reports of exercises and live fire drills that uh, seem to be uh, moving in the other direction. So uh, we hope to continue with di dialogue and diplomacy, and we hope that that dialogue and diplomacy bears fruit. Just to press you, since we were not in these actual sessions, am I correct to understand that the Russian side did not commit to any follow-on talks beyond the OSCE? be it the Russian NATO venue or some bilateral venue or any other venue? Well, uh, a couple things. So I think you heard, and I, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't dare speak for the Russian Federation, but I think you heard uh, from them today uh, that they were going to undertake consultations back in Moscow, um, which uh, we understand to be the case. Uh, the deputy did say after her uh, engagement with uh, uh, Foreign Minister Ryabkov uh, in Geneva on Monday, uh, that we would expect to have uh, additional engagement with the Russian Federation uh, in the coming days. Uh, we hope that uh, engagement takes place. We hope this diplomatic uh, track continues. Uh, but even more importantly, we hope it bears fruit. Uh, Francesca. I, just to follow up on sure. that, um, do you have any update on what form this uh, follow-up engagement uh, between uh, the U.S. and Russia may ha take uh, in the following days when it will happen? If it will be at what level, the presidents, the 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 the, the, the secretaries, etc. I, I don't have anything I'm able to uh, share at this point today. But what I can tell you about the, uh, what I can tell you about is the process uh, to get there. And part of the process, a, a core element of the process, was uh, the engagement we had on Monday. Uh, was the engagement that NATO as an alliance had today. Uh, in Brussels, uh, but just as importantly, if not in some ways even more importantly, uh, was what has taken place before uh, Monday in the uh, weeks and months 
uh, since November, uh, but also what took place in the aftermath of Monday and before uh, the meeting of the NATO-Russia Council today. And that is the concerted uh, dialogue, consultation, coordination uh, that we have undertaken with our NATO allies, with European partners, uh, with other uh, multilateral organizations and bodies to include the G7, the EU, uh, and uh, other groupings of countries like uh, the B9, and of course our engagements uh, with, the, uh, with our Ukrainian partners as well. Uh, so what we learned uh, on Monday, uh, what we heard from uh, the Russian delegation today in Brussels, we are comparing notes uh, with all of those allies and partners uh, as we figure out how best to continue down uh, this path of dialogue and diplomacy, making clear that it remains our strong preference. Uh, we have um, made no bones about that, uh, and we hope that uh, in um, uh, that we will uh, continue to see the Russians uh, take part in that engagement. So then if, I, sorry, if I may, um, what happens if uh, there is no de-escalation, the, the, the troops remain at the border, but no escalation either? They don't invade Russia, uh, Ukraine, sorry. Because you said uh, for the sanctions to remain a hypothetical, you need progress and de-escalation. Does that mean that if the statu quo remains, some part of the sanctions can be uh, enacted? Well, we've been very clear that the package of measures that we have spoken to uh, with our allies and partners, that package would be uh, enacted in the event of additional Russian aggression against Ukraine. So what uh, happens if there's a statu quo? Uh, if, if there is a status quo, um, we will continue to engage in diplomacy and dialogue. Uh, but we've been very clear that that diplomacy and dialogue uh, can only produce results if it takes place in the context of de-escalation. Uh, in all of this, our goal uh, has not been to have talks for the sake of talks. Uh, diplomacy, of course, is a means to an end. And the end we would like to see here uh, are reciprocal measures that redound positively on our collective security. Our collective security, meaning uh, the security of the United States, of the transatlantic alliance, of NATO, of our European partners as well. Uh, there are other areas, and Moscow has made clear they have their own purported concerns. Uh, it seems that they too uh, would like to see certain steps taken, some of which we have made very clear non-starters, uh, others of which may not be. And so if we are to make progress, if we are to arrive at uh, and take action on those reciprocal measures, uh, that will need to take place in the context of de-escalation. So, okay, just let me get this straight. So 13 and a half minutes in, um, the answer to my question, has anything changed since the Deputy Secretary spoke in Brussels? The answer is no, right? But, but which, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me ask. You could have just said no, nothing is different, and you, and, and instead, I, I get Matt, why I, we, we this, won't be put on the defensive for being transparent and having the deputy secretary go out there and give a long press conference and I give three interviews and the secretary any, general of NATO doing the same. If the transparency changed, is too much for you, we will uh, we can have that discussion. You were all very transparent in Brussels. So has anything changed since then? That was a very easy question, the, I think, to answer. And you could have just said no, but instead you spent 14, 13 and a half Matt. Minutes. I, your colleagues are welcome to ask any question they of would like. They I am. Not, I am happy to answer any question they would them. like. I'm not after you. I am answering. I am answering the questions that your colleagues Fair. asked. Okay. Would anyone else dare ask a question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Courtney. Thanks. Uh, so, I mean, are you, the U.S., NATO, and the Russians even operating under the same a common set of definitions on de-escalation right now? Um, and what sort of timeline are we talking about? Francesco asked you about the status quo. I mean, it sounds as though a stalemate doesn't necessarily trigger sanctions. So, you know, I, I'm reminded of, of Iran where the, the window is narrowing, you know. So how long are we are we talking about for a, a persistence of the status quo without consequences or change? Well, I, I would hasten to urge you not to make comparisons between those two challenges. They're, the, the nature of them is, is very different. Uh, Iran is uh, day after day making progress on its nuclear program uh, in a way that need not be the case uh, when it comes to Ukraine uh, and Russia and what we've seen of uh, Russian forces uh, building up along Ukraine's borders. Uh, it's our goal in all of this to forestall uh, any additional Russian aggression uh, against Ukraine. It is our hope that we can make progress uh, as quickly as possible, uh, but I'll make a couple points to, to temper that. Uh, one, uh, we are obviously coming at this uh, with very little uh, in common. 
Uh, and I think you have heard that uh, over uh, recent days. You probably knew that uh, even before Monday because the Russians have been very public uh, in the two treaties they have published about what it is that they seek. Uh, and it should have come to know uh, as no surprise to uh, anyone, at least to any informed observer, uh, that some of what they put forward was uh, and is an absolute non-starter for us. Uh, so when you talk about a Venn diagram of uh, overlapping areas uh, that could potentially bear fruit, um, it takes some work uh, to identify that, given the starting position. Uh, second, and this was especially the case uh, in the context of the Strategic Stability Dialogue, uh, issues of strategic stability, issues of arms control, uh, these are issues that uh, typically aren't resolved in hours, days, uh, or even weeks. These are issues uh, that uh, are complex, uh, that uh, involve uh, multiple countries uh, within our own system. It involves uh, multiple departments and agencies, uh, and the same would be true uh, of the Russian Federation. Uh, so we have to take into account uh, the nature of some of the issues that we're talking about. But we've also been clear, and the Secretary, the way he put it, was that progress can't be achieved when there is a gun pointing at Ukraine's head. Uh, and so, again, we continue to believe that the sort of meaningful, reciprocal measures that would redound positively on our collective security and that uh, the Russians uh, would uh, view as favorable uh, to their positioning as well, uh, those are elements that can only be achieved in the context of de-escalation. De-escalation could take place tomorrow. It could take place Friday. Uh, that is what we would like to see happen. It has not taken place yet. Uh, and in fact, there are some indications that we've seen movement in the opposite direction. Uh, but de-escalation is, when I, when I was speaking to the uh, more difficult, complex uh, issues that we're grappling with in the context of arms control and how that could take uh, weeks or even longer, uh, de-escalation is not something that should take weeks or even longer. Uh, it would uh, take one individual in the Russian system uh, giving an order uh, and us seeing that progress, uh, us seeing that order translate into de-escalation on the ground. Yes, Hiba. Thank you, Ned. Uh, allow me to indulge because I have a few questions on sure. Iran and one on Yemen. On Iran, a European um, representative told Reuters that um, he believes that February 1st should be the cut day, uh, who is privy, obviously, to the negotiation in Vienna. Um, and that should be the final date uh, to achieve some kind of agreement. Um, I know that you keep saying that the window is not open forever, so do you agree with this assessment, number one? And second, um, the U.S. representative, Rob Mali, met with the GCC representative in Vienna, and I know, again, that you negotiate and you consult often with your Gulf allies, but what prompted this meeting to take place in Vienna? Is it something that to do with the security arrangement that the GCC countries has demanded in the negotiation. Um, and finally, on Iran, um, it seems that some reports indicating that the White House, and I, I believe the State Department too, will resort to a new strategy closer to this time to say that the Trump administration is to be blamed for withdrawing from the agreement. That was reported today. Um, I don't know how accurate is this information. Maybe you can answer these questions. Uh, sure. So let me uh, take those in order. Uh, so first on the time frame, I would make a couple points. Uh, you've heard from us that the runway uh, is short. Uh, the runway is very, very short. Uh, we are not talking about uh, a protracted period of time that remains. Uh, we are talking about potentially weeks, not months. Uh, second, it is impossible uh, for us, at least at this point, uh, to point out a date on the calendar and say that is the deadline. Uh, and it is impossible for a simple reason. Uh, you've heard me say before, this is not a temporal clock that is ticking down. Uh, it is a clock that is based on and a calendar that is based on technical assessments. And really what we are looking at here uh, is a very simple equation. When do the non-proliferation benefits afforded by the JCPOA as uh, finalized in 2015 and implemented in 2016, when are they overcome by the advancements that Iran has made in its nuclear program uh, since it began to break free from the limits uh, that it previously subscribed to 
after the last administration left the JCPOA. Uh, that is an assessment that will be based on uh, a whole series of inputs, uh, what uh, we can discern publicly and uh, non-publicly regarding uh, those advancements and their implications uh, for things like Iran's breakout time uh, when it comes to acquiring enough fissile material uh, needed to uh, produce a nuclear weapon if they were to uh, move in that direction. Uh, remind me of your second question. Oh, the Jesus. meeting with the GCC. Uh, so as you know, uh, Rob Malley uh, often uh, meets with the GCC uh, before the start of the uh, uh, before the start of the seventh round, I believe it was. Uh, he took part in a virtual meeting uh, with the members of the GCC to brief them on the status of uh, our pursuit of a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. Secretary Blinken uh, had an opportunity to meet um, both in person and virtually uh, with representatives of the GCC when we were in New York City for uh, the UN General Assembly in September. Uh, and uh, Rob Malley and his team, uh, in addition to others here in this building, are regularly uh, updating our GCC partners uh, on our progress. Uh, when it comes to our GCC partners, uh, you've also seen them issue uh, statements and um, speak favorably of a potential return to compliance uh, with the JCPOA. Of course, that always that wasn't always the case, uh, but uh, you have heard from countries around the world, including in that region, uh, that uh, the uh, reimposition of verifiable and permanent limits on Iran's nuclear program uh, would be in our would be to our advantage, uh, and that's precisely what we're seeking to do. Uh, when it comes to what you've read about uh, the, the messaging strategy, I think I was uh, actually quoted uh, in that article, so uh, uh, I have a hard time distancing myself from it. But look, this is not a point we haven't made before. Uh, and it was a point that was as obvious on January 21st as it is on uh, 2021, as it is on January 12th, 11th, 12th of 2022. Uh, that is that we inherited a situation uh, that none of us would have wished for. Uh, a situation uh, in which Iran had been galloping forward in its nuclear program, freed from the nuclear shackles uh, to which it previously subscribed, uh, with proxies that uh, certainly were not cowed, uh, but in some ways have become even more brazen and aggressive, uh, with uh, Iran, I should say with the United States, uh, in some ways more isolated diplomatically uh, than Iran because of the course uh, that the previous administration had pursued. I think if you ask anyone in this administration if we would have preferred uh, to have entered into office on January 20th uh, with Iran's nuclear program verifiably and permanently constrained uh, and Iran permanently barred from ever obtaining a nuclear weapon, uh, the answer would be a resounding yes. Uh, if you, as I just mentioned, were to ask our GCC partners whether they would, would have preferred that, uh, the statements that you have heard from them recently uh, indicate that they would as well. Uh, you have heard statements from uh, within the Israeli security and defense establishment uh, that the nonproliferation benefits uh, conveyed by the JCPOA uh, also uh, redounded positively on Israel's uh, security. You've heard similar statements uh, from countries around the world, need not speak of the P5 plus one. Of course, we're working uh, now, this administration now, is working uh, very closely uh, with them, uh, both our European allies and our partners in this context, uh, to see to it if we can arrive once again uh, at a formula uh, by which Iran is permanently and verifiably prevented from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Thought, yes? Sorry, I, I have just a follow-up on question. Sure. Yeah. But as you know, this agreement is limited by time. There's a time limit of 10, 15 years. There is, there mean, is not. Are you kicking the road, uh, the can down the road for the next administration to deal with it? No, this is not about kicking the can down the road because uh, what is not time limited is the most important element of this, uh, the fact that Iran cannot acquire a nuclear weapon. Uh, the inspections and the monitoring uh, that goes along with this, uh, that is not time limited. Uh, so this is not about kicking the can down the road. This is about uh, permanently and verifiably uh, ensuring that Iran cannot obtain a nuclear weapon. Yeah, and on Yemen, just quickly, um, the government forces managed to get Shabwa uh, from the hands of the Houthis, and it seems that they make an advance towards Ma'rib. Um, do you think that this military advances or successes, if you want to call them, can be translated in some kind of diplomatic gains while the U.S. push for more of a um, 
a new approach if, if you wish to uh, get the Houthis back to negotiation? Uh, we have uh, sought to underline a core point that uh, the Houthis cannot engage in a military offensive uh, and uh, expect to gain any leverage by that. Uh, it will not work for uh, the United States. It will not work for our Saudi partners. It will not work for the UN Special Envoy uh, and his team uh, when it comes to this. All the continued Houthi offensives uh, will do, whether it's Marab or elsewhere, is uh, aggravate uh, the humanitarian emergency uh, that is gripping the country of Yemen, that for some time, by many estimates, has been home to the world's worst humanitarian catastrophe. Uh, so if the Houthis are under the misimpression that continued uh, military advances, continued military offensives, uh, will do anything but isolate them uh, and weaken their hand, uh, they are uh, sorely uh, mistaken. Affirmatively, we've been uh, intensively engaged uh, with the UN, with uh, Yemeni and regional leaders uh, to do all that we can uh, to advance a durable uh, and negotiated resolution that uh, does the opposite of what the Houthis are doing right, right now. Uh, to bring it into the conflict, to improve the humanitarian conditions uh, of the many people, and to give them uh, the space for them to collectively uh, determine their own future. Uh, this is, in our estimation at least, translated into uh, important building blocks that have the potential to pave the way for what we hope is a cessation of hostilities and uh, ultimately uh, peace in, in, uh, in Yemen. Uh, just to recap the, the state of play, our diplomatic engagement uh, has helped build an unprecedented international and regional consensus uh, on the need for an immediate comprehensive ceasefire uh, and political resolution. Uh, this is the opposite of what the Houthis have done. As, as we have um, uh, put a spotlight uh, on the need for diplomacy and uh, brought this uh, coalition and constellation of countries and entities together, uh, the Houthis and their own actions uh, have only isolated them uh, diplomatically. We've worked closely with uh, the UN Special Envoy, Hans Grunberg, uh, and other international partners uh, to encourage a new and more inclusive uh, UN-led peace process. Our Special Envoy, Tim Linderking, is uh, engaging with a range of Yemeni groups, and that includes um, women leaders, uh, it includes civil society leaders, in an effort to promote uh, a more inclusive peace process uh, and to amplify uh, precisely what we've heard from them. And those are calls for peace, for accountability, uh, and for humanitarian uh, relief. And when it comes to humanitarian relief on the issue of Yemen, uh, we remain one of the largest single donors to that humanitarian response. Uh, to date, we've provided over $4 billion to alleviate the suffering uh, of the Yemeni uh, people. Uh, and we are continuing uh, to encourage the international community, uh, just as the UN uh, is doing, uh, to do even more. Uh, so we are working along all of these tracks. Uh, this is uh, a challenge that we have prioritized since the earliest days of this administration. You saw that uh, with the appointment of Tim Linder King uh, within the first uh, several days of, of the administration uh, as a tangible sign uh, of the priority we attach to this, Simon. Uh, sorry, I just thought, does it, are they still there in Vienna? Or, and do they Rob, is, Rob is still in Vienna. And, and, and they're not planning to come back until the whatever round of this is is, is over? I, I suspect they will come back when there's a break or when this round ends, but okay. uh, as you know, the, the then European you, External you, Action you Service. You said several times that this is not a temporal clock, mm -hmm. and yet you talk about you say we're talking about potentially weeks. Well, not because months. because now, because it's clear the technical assessment within but, the course but of that weeks. That is a temporal clock, right? And you also I, talk about breakout time, which so, is temporal. So, and so I, I so I mean, there is a temporal clock aspect uh, to this. Well, Maybe it, not it in is. Terms of it is. It is minutes, it, but it's certainly in terms of uh, days and weeks. It is temporal right? in the sense that it will be weeks and not months, but it is not right. temporal. Uh, Calendar-wise, in the sense that it will be February first or February fourth or well, any other date, but it is. Date. 
if you're talking uh, about uh, potentially weeks, not months. Uh, eventually, Matt, we, we yeah. will know uh, right. precisely the date when the nonproliferation right. benefits then, have been so then, eroded. And, and then secondly, and on, on this, this whole thing about blaming uh, the Trump administration for it, you know, this is, as you said, it, it's not new. And, uh, you know, I can go back to December 17th with a senior official who may or may not be in curr currently in Vienna right now saying, you know, really going after the Trump administration. But who is the audience for this? And what do you expect to get out of saying, well, this is all Trump's fault? I mean, the Iranians know that it was Trump that withdrew. The Europeans know that it was, so I, know so that it was Trump that withdrew. So what, what exactly is the strategy, if there is some new strategy? So I, I would take issue with the characterization of a blame game. This is not about assigning blame. This is about explaining how we got here. Well, fine. Uh, it is, it is, it is about reminding the history and the what, context what, and the what inheritance. Do you, what uh, do you expect to get from telling people what is pretty obvious to, you know, yes, it, the Matt, it, it, it may be obvious to you, it may be obvious to me, it may be obvious to others in this room that the Trump administration uh, left a deal I, that was verifiably working, but it may not be obvious to people who aren't. Uh, as close observers, and that's that's really my job well, is to you're, you're, explain well, to people no, who no, aren't who aren't Matt Lewis of the world. <laughs> yeah, well, your line those unlucky is that souls. It was your line is that it was verifiably working. Let's just stop it right there. Everybody knows the Trump administration left the deal. It's your opinion that it was verifiably. It's not. It's not my opinion. It's the opinion of the intelligence community of this department under the Trump administration and of the international uh, of the IAE of International Weapons Inspectors. So it's not my opinion. Well, well, hold on. No, no. It was the opinion of this building that the, the Iranians were complying with the agreement. But it was the opinion of a lot of other people that even compliance with the agreement didn't do enough because, and that gets me to my last point. I'll be really brief. Is that you keep talking about how this is permanently. You know, it permanently prevented Iran from um, from uh, developing a nuclear weapon. But you know that that is based entirely on whether I Iran was going to stick with the NPT and, and its obligations under that, and uh, whether this alleged fatwa was really going to be respected. We we to, to be clear, we've never relied on a uh, on a fatwa uh, to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. If they want to uh, if they want to put that forward, that's that's up to them. What we've relied upon. Uh, are uh, scrupulously negotiated uh, protocols, uh, including the JCPOA, including the NPT, including the additional protocol, uh, that speak to the fact that Iran, uh, when it was in full compliance, as it was uh, when the last administration pulled out, uh, would be verifiably and permanently barred from obtaining a nuclear weapon. But, but <laughs> the problem is that there are a lot of people who don't think that, that, that it did that. And in fact, in like five years, all of the restrictions that were imposed outside of the MPT would be lifted. That, well, that's that's not true, uh, and we can go through them chapter and verse. But uh, let me just well, well, the, let's, let's, the top line point is the most important restriction that Iran could never obtain a nuclear weapon uh, is is permanent, has no expiration date. Simon, Iran, Iran, sure. uh, <clears throat> question as well. Um, just wanted a specific response to after a meeting with Rob Malley, the the Russian ambassador to the IAEA. Uh, said the fe uh, tweeted the feeling is that negotiations are moving forward. Is that, is that a characterization of you that you would agree with of what's happening in Vienna, or are you more on the side of uh, what the French Foreign Minister Le Drian said yesterday, which was, you know, there was progress in December, but things seem to have slowed down uh, and it's all moving too slowly. We're we're uh, uh, we're on the side of, of what we have said uh, that we have seen modest progress uh, in in recent weeks. Uh, now, modest progress is better than no progress. Uh, modest progress is not as good as significant progress. Modest progress is also not uh, sufficient uh, if we are going to be able to uh, achieve what uh, we sincerely and steadfastly seek to achieve, and that's a mutual return to compliance. Uh, what we hope to see in Vienna uh, going forward is uh, more than modest, uh, but that is uh, up to the Iranians, the pace at which uh, they want these negotiations, these indirect negotiations, to proceed. Sure. And just uh, onto North Korea, uh, the sanctions that you've released today, you're targeting North Koreans, uh, including North Koreans based in China and a Russian and a Russian company. Um, uh, I guess, firstly, why mm -hmm. why are there no Chinese or Chinese companies uh, in this particular round of sanctions? Uh, given that these North Koreans are based in China, you know, presumably they are procuring. Uh, Chinese material and and more broadly, do you think Russia and China uh, are doing enough to enforce the the UN sanctions that you say are breached by 
these launches? Uh, well, just to review the bidding on this, um, today we in the Department of the Treasury impose sanctions on eight DPRK-linked individuals and entities pursuant to Executive Order 13382. Um, the designations that we put forward uh, targeted one DPRK individual, one Russian individual, and one Russian entity uh, that together worked to procure multiple goods with ballistic missile applications for uh, the DPRK. Uh, but uh, to your question, the Department of the Treasury uh, targeted five uh, PRC and Russia-based uh, representatives of a DPRK entity, and this entity is subordinate uh, to the DPRK's Second Academy of Natural Sciences, Sciences uh, which uh, is uh, the target of UN uh, designations, is also the target uh, of previous uh, U.S. designations uh, from 2010 to um, for its support of uh, the DPRK's uh, weapons program. Uh, when it comes to uh, sanctions and, and designations that uh, are in place, uh, these are uh, an important. These are important measures uh, to. Uh, constrain uh, North Korea's uh, ballistic missile uh, and nuclear program. Uh, and it's important that the international community send a strong, unified message uh, that the DPRK must halt provocations, it must abide by its obligations under UN Security Council resolutions, uh, and engage in sustained and intensive uh, negotiations. Now, obviously, uh, we have not seen uh, all of that. Um, the, these, UN, uh, uh, these UN Security Council resolutions, the U.S. Uh, designations and sanctions, uh, they will remain in effect, and uh, we urge all UN member states to fulfill their obligations uh, under those resolutions. Okay. Yes? Um, uh, I have a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Uh, is it accurate that uh, the West has offered Iran to negotiate uh, a temporary uh, deal instead of uh, returning to uh, the JCPOA? And can you give Iran any guarantees that the next uh, administration won't withdraw from the deal? And I have uh, another one on Syria, if you don't mind. Uh, look, we have been um, uh, resolute in this. What we seek, uh, at least at this point, uh, and that, that uh, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about the clock, but what we continue to seek uh, is a mutual return to compliance uh, with the JCPOA. Um, we still believe that uh, a mutual return to compliance is in America's national security interest. We believe it's in uh, the interests of uh, our allies uh, and partners. The president uh, has been clear, and I think you saw this in a statement in uh, October that emanated from our meeting with the European Quad when President Biden uh, got together with his uh, counterparts in Rome, I believe it was. Uh, where we made clear that we are prepared to return to full compliance with the JCPOA and to stay in full compliance with the JCPOA as long as Iran does the same. Uh, there is no such thing as a, a guarantee in uh, diplomacy and international affairs. We can speak for this administration, but this administration has been very clear, as you have seen in formal statements, uh, that we are prepared to return to full compliance with the G JCPOA and to stay in full compliance with the JCPOA as long as Iran does the same. What about the temporary deal? We, we are focused at the moment on uh, seeing if we can achieve a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. And on Syria, uh, U.S. senators and representatives from uh, the two parties have sent a letter to the president yesterday uh, asking the administration not to allow Arab countries to uh, normalize their relations with the Syrian regime. Uh, do you have anything uh, on, uh, on this letter? Uh, well, uh, this question has uh, come up here uh, several times, and uh, we've been very clear uh, that uh, we are not encouraging, and in fact, uh, we uh, believe that the conduct that the Assad regime has demonstrated, in, including uh, the atrocities that it has inflicted on its own people, uh, this is not the time for rehabilitation uh, of the Assad regime. Uh, in some ways, this is, an, this is a regime uh, that cannot be rehabilitated, given uh, what the Assad regime has uh, inflicted on its own people. But you're not preventing these Arab countries from uh, normalizing with the regime and well, bringing uh, it to uh, the Arab League again. Uh, uh, this gets to what we've discussed in other contexts already in this briefing. Uh, countries are free to choose their own foreign policy course. Uh, in the course of our own foreign policy, in the course of our diplomacy uh, with countries, and this has come up 
uh, in a number of settings, both public and private. Uh, we've made very clear that now is not the time uh, to rehabilitate the Assad regime, given the atrocities uh, they've inflicted. Yes, sir. I have a follow-up question on the sanctions on the DPRK. Uh, it seems to be it's clearly a hostile action to DPRK. So I'm just wondering if uh, there is any change on uh, U.S. engagement policy to DPRK. This is number one. And uh, secondly, the President of Republic of Korea emphasized the significance of uh, declaration to end uh, Korean War despite uh, the recent ballistic missile test by DPRK. So uh, is this end of war declaration still an option for the United States? Could you give us some update on the declaration, please? Uh, on your first question, uh, I would strenuous, strenuously uh, object to uh, the idea that these sanctions uh, indicate uh, anything other uh, than uh, a genuine effort to constrain North Korea's, in this case, their ballistic missile programs, uh, which are um, run afoul of uh, international uh, UN Security Council uh, resolutions and present a threat to, uh, potentially, to the United States, to uh, our partners and allies uh, in the region. Uh, this is about our ongoing efforts to prevent the advancement of the DPRK's WMD and ballistic missile programs and to follow, uh, and, and they follow the, the DPRK's decision to launch six ballistic missiles uh, since September uh, of this year, including as recently as this week, again, all of which violated uh, multiple UN Security Council uh, resolutions. When it comes to our um, DPRK policy, uh, that remains uh, unchanged. Uh, these steps, again, are about preventing threats to the United States, uh, to our allies, uh, and to our partners. Our commitment to uh, the defense, to the security uh, of our treaty allies, Japan and South Korea, uh, the commitment we have to uh, the safety and security of Americans, including uh, service members and others in the region, uh, that is something that uh, we are, that, that is sacrosanct to us. What about the declaration? to end the Korean War? Uh, we, uh, when it comes to um, uh, end of war uh, declaration, look, we uh, have been very clear that uh, we seek uh, dialogue, we seek diplomacy uh, to bring about uh, lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we remain committed to that. Uh, we have made clear that uh, we are willing, ready, and able to engage uh, in that diplomacy in close coordination and consultation uh, with our allies uh, and partners. Andrea. You said you just said the policy towards the DPRK remains unchanged to prevent threats to the U.S. and our allies, essentially. How is that policy working since their advances have been extraordinary? I mean, you inherited this, but the advances just in the last year uh, indicate, you know, SLBMs, the missile advances uh, just this week and last week. So how is that preventing the threats? Clearly the policy is not working to prevent threats. The th threats are increasing. Is there a thought to changing the policy to try to get them to engage, to come up with some other way to get them to respond to the overtures from this administration? So I'd, I'd make a couple points. Um, we continue to believe that if we are going to uh, bring about uh, a lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula, if we are going to bring about uh, the de denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, and that remains our goal, that the only effective way to do that, the only durable way to do that, uh, is through dialogue and diplomacy. Uh, I do not think that you will see that posture change, uh, just because diplomacy, in this case... Dialogue or diplomacy, how do you get them to engage? So uh, we get them to engage by making clear uh, exactly what our uh, posture is, uh, by uh, making clear that the United States stands ready uh, with our allies and partners to engage uh, in diplomacy, just as you saw us do today. We continue to enact measures that uh, con put constraints uh, on these WMD and ballistic missile programs that hold uh, proliferators and other bad actors uh, accountable for their uh, activity. Uh, we'll continue to do that. Uh, but just because we are enacting measures that uh, hold uh, individuals and entities to account 
Uh, that doesn't mean that our belief in the importance and the value of diplomacy and dialogue is diminished. Uh, and in fact, uh, what we've seen from the DPRK in recent days only underscores our belief uh, that if we are going to uh, make progress, uh, that we will need to engage in that dialogue uh, and the offer stands. Doesn't the fact that, they, that he has continued to expand his program despite COVID, despite famine, despite sanctions, indicate that some rethinking has to be made? He, the, the sanctions don't seem to be deterring him at all. Well, uh, it is our estimation that some rethinking will need to be done in Pyongyang. Uh, again, this is, you, you said it yourself, Andrea, uh, the DPRK uh, is in uh, what by uh, many accounts is a dire humanitarian situation. There is COVID. Uh, there is uh, deprivation. Uh, there is poverty, of course. Uh, if these issues are to, uh, if these are to, conditions are to improve, something will need to change. Uh, and uh, it is our estimation and it is our belief uh, and the belief of our allies and partners that uh, the DPRK regime is inflicting uh, tremendous hardship on their own people that by diverting precious resources that should be going uh, to food, that should be going uh, to basic uh, provision of basic services, that should be going uh, to public health uh, to these ballistic missile and WMD programs. Uh, that is not something that is going to serve the interests uh, of the people of uh, the DPRK. It's not something that serves their interests now. It's not something that will serve their interest uh, over uh, the long term. Yes. To follow up, because uh, you keep mentioning the sanctions to constrain, but you said yourself this was the sixth test this year, and reportedly the second hypersonic test, reportedly, in less than a week. So, I mean, I just don't understand how you can say or how you could feel that these this constraint policy is working. Um, what I would say is that. Uh, our, our policy on this uh, is that uh, diplomacy and dialogue is the only way we're going to resolve this. Uh, it only, in our mind, underscores uh, the urgent need for Pyongyang to engage in that uh, dialogue. This is not a challenge that uh, any administration would be able to solve uh, in the course of uh, several months. This is a challenge that has developed uh, over the course of uh, years and, in fact, decades. Uh, it's a challenge that, as you know, uh, spans multiple administrations. Uh, and it goes back uh, decades now, uh, as I said. Uh, our goal remains the complete denuclearization of uh, the Korean Peninsula. And uh, we continue to believe that serious and sustained diplomacy uh, is the only way we'll be able to make uh, tangible progress towards that. Uh, so uh, progress may uh, be slow going. Uh, obviously, this is a, a challenge that has proven uh, difficult uh, over the course of uh, administrations. Uh, but again, we believe in the utility, the potential utility of diplomacy uh, if we are going to make progress. I've got two. They're ver they'll be very brief and they're unrelated to any of this. One, they're both about individual people. Uh, one in Bahrain, I've, raised, I've asked about this case before, about uh, the academic Abdul Jalil Alsengis, who's now in a hunger strike. Uh, people have been calling for his release, including. I don't know exactly if you've called for his release before, but you have been paying attention to this case, and I'm wondering if there's anything new you have to say about that. One, and then there's another individual case already. I, I'm not aware that we have anything new, but if we do, we'll let you know. Okay, and then in Israel, uh, uh, last night or yesterday, uh, there was an 80-year-old Palestinian-American man who was uh, uh, pulled out of a car, apparently, allegedly, uh, and beaten and, and, and killed, uh, Omar Abdul Majid Assad. Uh, he's an American citizen. You, are you following this case? Have you said anything to the Israelis about it? Uh, we can confirm uh, the death of a U.S. citizen, Omar Assad, uh, in a, a city near Ramallah. Uh, we have been in touch with Mr. Assad's family to express our condolences about this tragedy. Uh, we're providing, as you would expect, all appropriate consular assistance to uh, the family at this time. Uh, we've also been in touch with the government, government of Israel to seek clarification about this incident. Uh, and uh, as you may have seen, the Israeli Defense Forces have indicated there's an ongoing investigation into the matter, uh, and we support a thorough investigation into the circumstances uh, of this incident. Uh, of course, uh, out of respect for 
uh, the family during this time, um, we uh, we have little more that we're able to offer. Okay, so just uh, in terms of incidents that like this, because uh, you know this is an extreme incident, but uh, there there are other there, there have been less extreme incidents in, in the past, uh, particularly as uh, the Israelis are pushing uh, harder and harder to get into the visa waiver program. Uh, is this the kind of incident? Is this the kind of thing that you guys would uh, do? You, you, you'll look at. There, there are stringent criteria that's associated with admission into the visa waiver program. Uh, it's a decision that the Secretary of Homeland Security, in consultation with the Secretary of State, makes. Uh, so I would point to the criteria associated with that. Thank you, Missy. Final question. Yeah, just, um, hopefully, you didn't say this. I uh, didn't miss it. Um, so the Russians said that they want the U.S. or that they think their understanding of the U.S. was going to come back with a written answer to the proposals that they put forward in those two documents. Is that? Correct, and it just seemed to me like each side was putting the onus on the other to take the next step because NATO is saying, or the United States is saying, yeah, we expect the Russians to go back to Moscow and take a look at these ideas we put on the table about the exercises and all of that. And the Russians are saying, we think the United States and NATO have to come back with these written answers or, or responses to our proposals. So first of all, are you gonna provide them written responses and do you agree with my assessment? Uh, well, we've been clear all week uh, following the Strategic Stability Dialogue on Monday that we do expect there will be additional engagement with the Russian Federation in the coming days. Uh, I know the Russian Federation has made various statements about what form uh, and modality that will take. Uh, again, uh, there we do expect there will be uh, additional engagement. It's also uh, no uh, secret that uh, it will require intensive consultations on the part of uh, the Russian delegation uh, with senior uh, Russian officials up to and including uh, President Putin. Uh, and I believe the Russian delegation itself uh, alluded to that today. For our part, uh, of course, we're doing, uh, we're consulting uh, within, uh, uh, here at home, uh, we, uh, within the executive branch, of course, we're um, briefing Congress as well. Uh, but uh, just as importantly, we are uh, working in close consultation with our allies and partners, comparing notes from Monday, comparing notes from today. Uh, we will be comparing notes from what we hear tomorrow uh, from the OSCE uh, permanent uh, council meeting. Uh, so we are doing all of that to determine uh, just what that next engagement uh, will look like, what it will convey uh, in terms of substance. Uh, but the bottom line for us is that continued engagement, continued diplomacy and dialogue uh, would be a good thing. Uh, we hope the Russians will continue to engage. Uh, but above and beyond all that, uh, we hope that turns into meaningful progress. And it can only turn into meaningful progress uh, in the context of de-escalation and not escalation. But will you guys provide the written answers? That's my question. That's uh, again, we're, we're not going to go into uh, the form, uh, the modality that uh, that engagement may take. Um, but we are committed uh, to continued dialogue and diplomacy and hope it can produce results. Thank you.